The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 18th chapter. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray always and not to lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor had respect for people. In that city there was a widow who kept coming to him and saying, Grant me justice against my opponent. For a while he refused. But later he said to himself, Though I have no fear of God and no respect for any woman, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out by continually coming. And the Lord said, Listen to what the unjust judge says. And will not God grant justice to his chosen ones who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long in helping them? I'll tell you, he will quickly grant justice to them. And yet when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? The Gospel of the Lord. You know, because of the numbers of times that you have spent in church, that sermons have different purposes. One sermon might have as its focus to educate. Another sermon might have as its focus to inspire. <clears throat> there are some sermons that seem to correct. And then another sermon might have as its purpose to admonish us or to pull us back from some point of view. And then there are some sermons that simply help to expose and to explain some theological truth. The sermon for today will seek to educate and to inspire. And I want to tell you at the very beginning that the sermon for today will not be based on any of the three lessons that are appointed. Instead, it is going to be focused on something that occurs in this and in most Lutheran churches. And that is what happens right here at this altar. This action that occurs here is known by several different names. Sometimes it is called simply the Holy Communion. There are those who call it instead the Holy Eucharist. And then shortly after the institution of this particular experience, it came to be known by a totally different name. And that is the Last Supper. The interesting thing about what occurs at this table is that it shows us that Jesus, in his short ministry on earth, was more of an actor than he was a preacher. Think about something. When he had finished preaching one day and a huge crowd was following him, he looked out at them and he realized what time it was and he knew that they were hungry. And what did he do? He borrowed the lunch of a little boy who was there. He told him to his disciples to bring the lunch to him and he blessed it and multiplied the loaves and fishes and fed the people. And in that Action. We see Jesus. On another occasion, he was walking along a road 
And there was a man who cried out to him, Son of David, have mercy on us. And the Lord turned to this man and said, What can I do for you? And the man said, Give me back my sight. And the Lord healed that individual. He acted. And so therefore, when we come to what occurs at this table, on the night before he died, the Savior did the simplest thing in the world. He did not give to his disciples a long, involved, and complicated list of instructions. He didn't leave them a volume of, you've got to do this, and you've got to do that, and you've got to do this. The Savior simply went to a table and he picked up two things. He picked up a piece of bread and he picked up a cup of wine and he said to them, if you want to remember me, this is the way that you can do it. And for more than 2,000 years, believers have been drawn to that piece of bread and to that cup because of the fact that they wanted to see Jesus, be with him, feel his presence. You need to remember something, though. When the Lord instituted the Holy Supper, he didn't make it a big banquet. It was not like some big family meal that you would have at your house with a table laden with food and candles around and all kinds of preparations made. No. The Lord, instead of choosing a palace in which to institute this supper, he chose instead an upper room. And to this very day, we do not know where that room was. We do not know who owned it. The only thing that we know is what happened within the room itself. And of course, the Lord chose not to institute this supper in either one of the major places of civilization of that day. He chose not to do it in Athens. He chose not to do it in Rome. He chose to do it in Jerusalem, which was a despised city. And by the year 70 AD, it would have been destroyed. We have to ask ourselves the question, though, what is it that gives this supper its lasting quality? What is it, how is it that this supper has continued for more than 2,000 years? What is it about it that gives it its life and its hope? There's one thing. The Lord knew that he, his life would end on the next day. And you remember, if you look in the 14th chapter of St. John's Gospel, you'll find that wonderful statement that the Savior makes to his friends. Let not your hearts be troubled. You believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And after the Savior of the world had made that statement of loving compassion, to his friends. He picked up from the table 
that piece of bread. And he held it before his friends and said, This, this is my body given for you. And then he reached down with his holy hands and he picked up that chalice and he said, this is my blood shed for you. And in the giving of that bread and in the shedding of that wine, something happened to those elements that they became the body and the blood of Christ. And when you come down this aisle, you're not receiving a pretend Jesus. You're not receiving a make-believe Jesus. You are receiving the sovereign God himself. His body. And his blood. I want you to remember something. Every single time that you present yourself to receive the sacrament of Holy Communion, you're receiving two gifts. The forgiveness of all of your sin since your last communion. Forgiveness. They're erased. They're wiped away. Scripture even says that God takes whatever we have done that is wrong, our evil, our misdeeds, our sin, and he drowns it in the depths of the ocean. So the first gift is the forgiveness of sins. And the second gift is the reminder that we're given eternal, unending, everlasting life with the Son of God. My dear friends, I want you to recognize something that when you come, you're going to notice something. When the elements are consecrated, I know that people will perhaps look at me and think, well, he's crazy. What is he doing? He's holding his hands up in the air and then he's bowing. Oh my goodness. To say the words of the Savior, this is the body of Christ, this is the blood of Christ, I cannot stand still. And when you see me bow, you don't hear it, but I am saying to the Lord, thank you, thank you, Father, for the gift of our Savior. I know that there's some people who might say, well, you know what? We're just too fancy about what we do with communion. It's just plain and simple, and you've got too much ceremony to go with it, and there's too much liturgy. I want you to think about something. Have you ever been to a wedding where people will stand up in their living room. Okay, John, okay, Mary, you stand up. Okay, I pronounce you married. No. They come to the church. They hear the organ playing. There are flowers. There's a preparation. There's a liturgy because this ceremony is binding two people together. When someone dies, what do we say? Oh, well, you know, just uh, they'll be embalmed or cremated at the funeral home, and uh, I'll meet you out there at the cemetery, and okay, we'll put them in the ground. No. No, we take this human life, this shell that came, that beheld this individual, and we handle it with the greatest care, and we surround it with dignity and reverence. 
if we do that for weddings, if we do that for funerals, we have no choice. We must do it whenever the Savior of the world comes to give himself. In the sacrament known as the sacrament of the altar, the Holy Communion. May you feel deeply the presence of our Savior in the sacrament.